This is the final go now go pull for flight three of Starship. Anybody two? Go. Stage one? Go. Stage two? Go. Flight directors, go for launch. Hello and welcome to the Terran Space Academy. This is Rocket Science, and we want to thank you for keeping in touch and helping us out on Patreon. You are the Terran Space Academy. If all goes well, the 5th of June will be the next flight of the Starship rocket system. Integrated Test Flight 3 on March 14th did much better than Flight 2, but several things went wrong. The booster was able to relight its 13 restartable engines and return to its designated landing area, more or less. Six engines, however, shut down earlier than programmed. The booster was still able to make its approved landing zone and tried to restart the seven of 13 engines that had ran properly before, but only two of these functioned this time. SpaceX said the issue was probably a blocked oxygen filter. Flight 4 will have additional filter hardware to prevent this from happening again. Individual filters for each oxygen line are more complicated, but can prevent one blockage from shutting down multiple engines. Another problem was that the hot staging ring seems to have shifted, possibly throwing off the center of mass and may have actually been lost. Along with several software and hardware upgrades being made, the hot staging ring will now be jettisoned for IFT-4. Since the ultimate goal is a fully reusable ship, this is probably a temporary fix. I have a question. If the Raptor rocket engine is a full flow stage combustion engine, explained in this lesson, could we get rid of the hot staging ring and do something different? Full flow means that all of the propellant goes through the turbo pumps. In this one, the oxygen turbo pump, a little bit of methane comes in here and is burned with some of the oxygen to power the pump. That sends a hot oxygen-rich gas combined with a little water and carbon dioxide into the combustion chamber. In the fuel turbo pump, a little bit of oxygen comes in here, burning with just a little bit of the methane, with the rest flowing on through, creating a hot fuel-rich gas, which goes into the combustion chamber, and these are then ignited with the oxygen-rich gas, probably using an infrared diode laser, I think. Here's my question. What if, at stage separation, SpaceX spins up and runs just the methane turbo pumps on these 20 outer engines. Some turbo pumps, like Rocket Lab's electro pumps or the RL-10's expander cycle pumps, can throttle down to just 15% of full thrust or as far as they want to take them down for the electro pumps. The SpaceX Raptor, however, uses staged combustion. That means the engine can only throttle down to the minimum propellant flow that keeps the pre-burner here working and spinning the turbine. For the Raptor, that's about 40% of full thrust, and that's about the same for most pre-burners. Let's do some math. Full thrust for the Raptor is given as 230 tons of force. We know that a metric ton is 1,000 kilograms, so that gives us 230,000 kilograms of force under 1G. 1G is 9.807 meters per second squared, and multiplying that by this value gives us 2,255,610 newtons. This would normally be reported as 2,256 kilonewtons or 2.26 meganewtons. But we'll leave it in newtons because we're not done. If we have the exhaust velocity and thrust of an engine, we can calculate the mass propellant flow. We don't have a given exhaust velocity here, but we know that the specific impulse of a sea level Raptor engine at liftoff is about 330 seconds. It'll improve a little bit as it goes up and the atmosphere quits pushing back into the belt. Our equations tell us that the exhaust velocity is calculated by multiplying the specific impulse by 1g. We'll use the previous value and round to 3,236 meters per second. Now we have what we need to calculate mass propellant flow. The formula is that thrust equals mass propellant flow times exhaust velocity. Rearranging this, we see that mass propellant flow equals thrust over exhaust velocity, and this gives us 697 kilograms per second mass propellant flow through the Raptor engine at full power, but we can keep going. The oxidizer to fuel mass ratio tells you how many kilograms of oxidizer is combined with how many kilograms of fuel in the combustion chamber. Here are some rough values to memorize. 
for RP-1 and liquid oxygen burning rocket engines, like the Saturn V, the Falcon 9, the Electron Rutherford, and the Firefly Alpha using Miranda engines. The value is around 2.7 to 1. For methane burning engines like the Raptor, BE-4, and Archimedes, it's closer to 3.7 to 1. For hydrogen fueled engines like the space shuttle main engines used on the SLS, the retired RS-68, or the still used RL-10, it's roughly 6 to 1. Using the value for methane, we can do the math and see that for every 4.7 total kilograms going through the engine, one of these kilograms, or about 21%, is methane, with the other 79% of the mass being oxygen. So 0.21 times 697 means that we have 148 kilograms going through the methane turbo pump for every 549 kilograms going through the oxygen turbo pump. Now what if we shut down this turbo pump entirely, the oxygen one? The great thing about this engine design is that everything can be adjusted separately. In other engines, one shaft turns both the turbo pumps, sometimes with gears, making this exercise much more difficult, if not impossible. But here, you can shut off just the oxygen turbo pump and run just the methane pump, turning our extremely powerful Raptor engine into a much gentler hot gas thruster. Now, we don't want to use almost pure hot oxygen gas, as this will burn almost anything. But we can use hot methane. We don't know the specific impulse that will be produced by this hot fuel-rich exhaust as it makes its way through the combustion chamber and nozzle, but we can estimate it. Now from what I can find, a methane-based cold gas thruster that just allows liquid methane to expand into a gas, like a nitrogen-based thruster, can produce a specific impulse of 114. The nitrogen-based cold gas thrusters are less efficient at about 60 to 80 seconds of specific impulse. But we are using hot gas, just like the Starship thrusters that vent from the methane tank Olegarian. Elon said these have a specific impulse in space of around 300 seconds, but they are optimized for this purpose. We are venting hot methane gas through a much too large nozzle. Let's go with 250 seconds. This gives an exhaust velocity of 2,452 meters per second. Multiplying this by our mass propellant flow of 148 kilograms per second gives us a thrust of 363,574 newtons. If we use this system on all the 20 outside engines, spinning up just the methane turbo pump with some high pressure gas, we can get a total thrust of 7,271,470 newtons, so 7,271 kilonewtons. This would only be 741 tons force, but it would be enough to move the Starship away from the booster safely, without blasting everything with Raptor fire. What else could we do with our new hot gas thruster mode? we could tune it down and land safely on the moon. A 250 metric ton starship landing on the moon would have a weight of 405,500 newtons. Our hot gas thrusters could bring that down safely, using nose RCS thrusters to keep us straight, without sending regolith into orbit. Something to think about. Starliner was also scheduled to launch on May 31st, then June 1st, and now sometime next week after malfunctioning ground support sensors interfered with propellant loading. The next two launch windows are Wednesday and Thursday. I'm wondering if, again, the delay didn't reveal something more serious that was wrong. But maybe not. Maybe Starliner will finally carry crew this week. We wish them the best of luck. And while America is trying desperately to get a $5 billion crew capsule to fly at least once, the Tycho Nauts from the perfectly functioning Shinzu 18 mission had their first spacewalk a few days ago. And Chang'e 6, China's latest from Lunar Triumph, touched down on the far side of the moon Sunday on the 1st of June, here in the Aiken Basin, where it will return samples to Earth. Everyone thinks they are looking for water ice this close to the South Pole, and I think they are. But are they also investigating the massive heavy metal asteroid that formed this crater and seems to be buried under the surface here? If this is the remnants of a metallic asteroid, similar but smaller than Psyche, it would have thousands of tons of iron for steel, rare earth elements, and even gold, platinum, and perhaps uranium. This could be the most valuable real estate anywhere on the moon. And China's there first. Something to think about. We will all hope the IFT-4 keeps America on track 
to build an outpost on the moon and later Mars. By the way, the cause of the uncontrolled roll during parabolic flight and re-entry for IFT-3 was clogging of valves for roll control. What clogged the valves? It's possible that gas expansion supercooled a propellant line and froze some liquid methane or created oxygen slush, which would block filters and valves. SpaceX has been working to resolve this too, and everything should be ready for IFT-4 around the 5th of June. One final thought. What should SpaceX do with the older Model 2 engines that have already been built? Should they make a Raptor 9? For next week, do some math on this proposed system. Calculating thrust, initial mass if the thrust to weight ratio is 1.5, and payload to orbit with a two-stage system. We'll assume a 10% dry mass and one second stage. Until then, stay safe. At Astro Proterra.